Hi folks, Robert Quigley here, America's Independent, Washington, D.C. We're on the road to the White House. Today, it's Quigley's Shadow Government, the Independence talk show as we dissect the issues along the way to the White House. So let's jump right in. Today, we're going to deal with a couple of uh, questions from voters across America, and uh, then we are going to... Uh, to deal with a, uh, with, with, with a review of the lay of the political uh, campaign trail. So we start with two questions, basically the same question from two different people. Uh, Chris Limbo and Ellen Snee from sunny New York. Both of these folks want to know about Quigley's abortion policy. And uh, Ellen goes on and makes a, 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 a very robust case in terms of the economic realities and difficulties facing uh, young families and, uh, and single mothers and folks who have very few financial resources uh, to, in fact, raise a family. So let's jump right in. What is Quigley's view on abortion? Well, let's, let's go with the starting point. The starting point goes all the way back to Reagan in the 80s. And Reagan said it best. You know, the only people that support abortion are folks that have already been born. So from that point of view, the question becomes, who is looking after and advocating the needs and lives of unborn children? Well, obviously that answer has to be the government. It's the job of any president of the United States, current and future, to look after the needs of all of the citizens across this great land. And that's where Quigley uh, will be when we get to the White House, is we will be looking after the interest of the unborn children. Now, does that mean that Quigley supports a total ban on abortion? No. There is a, there, it's not an all or nothing situation. On the one hand, I do not support unregulated abor abortion. And on the other hand, I do not support a total ban on abortion. So basically, we're talking about uh, Quigley supports partial regulation of abortion. Because remember, we must protect the legal interest of the unborn kids. Now, lots of the conversation in the last 50 years has centered on mom when it comes to abortion. But the reality of biology in the legal system is the the life and body of the unborn child is not the same as the life and body of the mom. These are two separate individuals. They are two separate living beings. And although they may be together for nine months, uh, the reality is uh, within a very short time after conception, uh, they, are, they are absolutely uh, two different living beings. So legal rights attach and uh, we, we have to deal with it from, from that point of view. Now, let's look at some of the extraneous issues. If we were to allow unregulated uh, population growth, then we wind up in the world of Robert Malthus. He's a philosopher from a couple of hundred years ago, British philosopher, who said that humanity was eventually going to eat itself into extinction. We were going to consume all of our resources, primarily through uncontrolled population growth, and the result was going to be uh, essentially extinction. And he saw that throughout the course of history in relation to small communities. When the small communities ran out of resources, they had to go to another community. They, they were warring with their neighbors to get more resources. And this has been the pattern, the ebb and flow pattern of humanity for our entire existence. Except when the world, the globe is overpopulated, we have no place else to go, and ultimately, we're doomed. So let's move on. What are some of the special cases in support of abortion? Rape, incest, viability of the fetus, deformity of the child. Of course, the government does not have an interest in producing lots of uh, uh, folks, uh, children, uh, that have an inability to take care of themselves. So if they have a very serious deformity, or the fetus is unviable, or they're going to live a life of misery, and the examples of what I'm talking about are horrific. You can imagine what I'm talking about. And clearly, uh, abortion is the right answer. Now, courts are very suited to answer these types of questions, and we can always set up a streamlined type of system 
uh, to uh, to make the decision whether or not there should be an abortion or not. And uh, I mean, we, we could empower doctors to do to make those decisions, or we can empower a doctor's tribunal uh, to make those uh, uh, decisions. Uh, of course, the, the the mom would be able to present evidence, the dad would be able to present evidence, and there would be a public advocate there. Uh, who would be looking after the interest of the unborn child, and then they would determine as a sort of a, a, a quick and easy uh, a tribunal uh, whether there were really circumstances to justify that abortion. Because make no mistake about it, abortion is murder of innocence, and there needs to be very, very good reasons for this to happen. Now, now Ellen uh, puts forth a very strong economic reality case, which I totally agree. Uh, $16 an hour we promote uh, even if you are making $16 an hour today, it's a poverty wage. Uh, when you need government benefits, the threshold is too low. Quigley totally agrees with that. We need to raise those thresholds to get the government benefit. Uh, we firmly believe in uh, adoption. We understand that poverty and economic circumstances have driven a lot of abortion decisions in the past. I believe that's wrong. I think we can use the, the, the uh, governmental system to ameliorate the economic impacts or harsh impacts. Government assistance should be available to moms. And then, of course, ultimately, the best answer that we have is, of course, uh, to prevent the conception from happening in the first place. So along those lines, Quigley is going to supercharge the National Institutes of Health. Uh, we talk to medical professionals all the time, uh, my campaign team. Uh, we have medical professionals in our families, for example. So we know that the science is not far away from introducing new ways to control conception. And that's where the ultimate answer lies, because if there's no life at stake, there's no abortion question, there's no moral issue, and we can move, all move on uh, with our lives as we wish. Uh, so in a nutshell, and kind of a, of a detailed discussion there, uh, that's the Quigley view and the path that we want to take on the abortion issue uh, moving forward. Uh, what we had prior to the recent Supreme Court ruling was a disaster. What we have right now after the, uh, the Supreme Court abortion ruling is a disaster too. So we, we, we can do better. Okay, so moving on, let's go to, let's go to another uh, voter question. Uh, this voter, his name is Jay Tor. Now, Jay comes from someplace across sunny America. He didn't say where he was from, but I love his question. It's worth talking about. So Jay says to me, Quigley, I looked through your videos and your audio files. I've spent a lot of time on your website, and you are a presidential candidate scam, he says. There is no way that you are going to be able to lower people's taxes by introducing all of those programs that you're talking about. You're going to raise everybody's taxes, he said, because that's the only way they're going to get paid for. Okay, okay, Jay, so let's jump right in. I appreciate your, your, uh, your give and take there and your, and your rib poking, but uh, let, let's get into it. The, we must understand the interactions and the interrelationships of the current system and the program that we're talking about. Ultimately, we will lower everybody's taxes. Unless you're a billionaire, your taxes are going up. But uh, how do we do that? Well, essentially, uh, let's just take one of the big programs at a time, and then we'll, we'll talk about the cause and effects and the interrelationships. So let's talk about climate repair. Yeah, we have to build a lot of CO2 scrubbers. We've got to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. we basically got to turn the thermostat, uh, thermostat down for the planet. And how do we do that? We're going to put a tax on fossil fuels, okay? So the fossil fuel tax is going to, going to go up. That will decrease the amount of fossil fuel shortage, uh, usage rather. And uh, on top of that, we'll use that money to pull CO2 out of the air, and we will then be able to lower the global temperature. So, and that will make life cheaper and better for all concerned, unless, of course, you're an oil company, you're paying more taxes, and if you are an out-of-control driver, you're paying more taxes. But what the higher tax rate will do on the fossil fuel industry is rationalize our use of fossil fuels to the downside. And we most definitely need to do that as quickly as possible. Now, the next big issue is we have something called Quigley Care. Quigley Care, we're going to divide the current system into two parts. Part one is going to be free uh, checkup uh, analysis, 
preventive health care, you go to the doctor, you find out what's wrong with you, they give you a prescription, you're okay in two weeks. That's all free. Everything else that we currently have is going to be in the second category, and, and uh, that will actually wind up being the expensive part of the health care system. Uh, but the insurance companies will be involved, Medicare, Medicaid, they will be involved. But the reality is, if we catch disease early, like say can cancer in its very early stages, only cost a couple thousand dollars, a few thousand dollars to treat, whereas if you get it at stage four, it may be a million dollar treatment. So if you take that example and you apply it across the board, by introducing this really quick and easy preventive health care component of the system, what we call Quigley Care, then we're able to catch disease early, we're able to treat conditions and illnesses early, and that lowers the system-wide cost. And by lowering the system-wide cost, we are able to lower the health care bill for everybody uh, that, you know, in this entire industry. So that's the cause and effect relationship there. Now the next big point is we're going to create 30 million new business owners across America. We're going to tweak the, the uh, SBA, make it easier to get an SBA loan, and we're not going to focus on credit scores or collateral. We're going to focus on your ability and experience to run the kind of business that you want to start. But ultimately, when we create 30 million new business owners, what we are also doing is we are simultaneously decreasing the demand for food stamps, welfare benefits, entitlement programs, and all of the rest of the uh, government entitlement expenditures. When people can take care of themselves, when families can take care of themselves, and communities can take care of themselves, then the cost to the government is lower. And when we do lower the government cost, that allows us to uh, reduce the taxes for all taxpayers. Now, the one exception to that are the extremely wealthy people, let's call them the top 10%, uh, especially the top two or 3%, because uh, they, have, they are essentially uh, making hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, and paying very little in taxes. I mean, almost nothing, and sometimes nothing. And, and that's the problem. So we need the, that group of folks to pay their fair share. We need to reduce the cost of the system. And then when we do that, uh, we're not taking 30 or 40% of average Mary and John's paychecks. You know, we're going to reduce that to some level, like, you know, 10 or 15%. I mean, whatever the numbers actually turn out to be, uh, this is for a, a discussion illustration, but that's the direction uh, that we are, are going. Next, we're going to improve the FHA and we're going to make it much easier to buy your first home. We're not going to focus on credit scores, for example. If you have been paying rent for two or three years, and let's say that your rent payment is $1,000 a month or $2,000 a month, whatever it is, then clearly you would be able to make the same mortgage payment. Uh, so why in the world would you not be eligible for a mortgage? Forget about your credit score. That's irrelevant. That's a giveaway to the financial world. We want folks to own their own homes because that creates deeper roots in the community, more stable societies, less crime. People feel like they're involved. They are, in fact, involved. And it's better for our resilience and our long-term sustainability. So we are increasing home ownership to probably the 85 or 90 percent level. And right now it's around 60 percent and it's been there for decades. We're going to make student loans freely bankruptable. It's the same kind of reasoning. We're going to lower the price structure by reforming the Fed. Basically, if we got more products and services to buy in the society through all those new business owners, we have a balance. And that's the key to lowering prices, is having a good balance between products and services on the one hand and cash availability and credit on the other hand. And the Fed can help achieve that goal, but we must reconfigure their focus and how they operate on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so, Jay, that generally is the answer to your question. It's not, a, it's not a shell game. It seems like it's complicated. It seems like there are a lot of steps that must happen and a lot of boxes that must be checked. But the overall uh, way to describe it is the Quigley administration is increasing the ability of individuals and families to take care of themselves, which then decreases the demand for government services all across the board. And we're talking about everything from, from police services to fire services to ambulance services and, and just the whole gamut of uh, possibilities there. So it does happen. And, uh, but we appreciate your comment. We appreciate your question. Thanks a lot. You're, you're, always, you're always welcome. 
Now let's move on. Uh, the next point that we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the current lay of the land. And, and normally in this segment of our talk show, we're basically going to look at what the competition is doing. So Quigley's got uh, three, three real uh, opponents in this election. We know, uh, we know Biden, we know Trump, and then there's uh, Robert Kennedy out there, and then, of course, there's Robert Quigley. Uh, the right in America's Independence, so make sure you remember to write my name on the presidential ballot when we get to Election Day on November 5th of 2024. But let's see what Biden has been doing at this point in our uh, campaign. Well, we all know that, uh, that Biden is uh, he, he's growing old, he's uh, growing feeble, He's, 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 you know, most of the community thinks that he is suffering from the early stages of dementia, uh, senility, no question about it. He basically is not intellectually rigorous. And he's falling for uh, traps left, right, and center. So what am I talking about? Uh, these few days, he's meeting with the, with the Chinese leader in, over in San Francisco, and, and he took bribes from the Chinese. This, I believe this 100%. I lived out in East Asia for 10 years. I was educated in Europe, America, East Asia. I started my career out there in the product world, the finance world, educational world, the law world. And I can tell you that, uh, that Biden is totally clueless, okay? The Chinese hate America. The Chinese have been prosecuting a drug war, what we call an opium war, against the United States for decades. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Google the opium wars from the 1800s between the British and the Chinese, and you will see that this is exactly what the Chinese have been doing against America for these last couple of decades. On, on top of that, uh, the Chinese use their commercial, business, and industrial policy to put American companies out of business. So large numbers of Chinese companies were basically financed, given free money by the Chinese government, the Chinese central banks, which is controlled by the Chinese government, with the sole purpose of taking market share from American companies. So what I'm explaining to you folks is the Chinese have been using economic warfare against the United States since the 1980s when they decided to open up their economy. Americans have been thinking that uh, China was, was economizing and democratizing and becoming America's friend. No, ch the Chinese want to be the global superpower, and the only thing that is stopping that, of course, is America. So they have been uh, engaged in a war against the United States for all of these years. And uh, Biden is, you know, he's, he's falling right into this trap. He's, he's, he's blathering on with the Chinese, uh, trying to show the world how friendly we are. And it's just total bull BS because there, there's not real friendship here. There is competitive, uh, 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 well, what's the right word here? Competitive, uh, cutthroat, put the other guy out of business uh, types of behavior. Uh, that, that's where, that's, so Biden's making a huge mistake. Quigley wouldn't do that. Uh, we would be approaching the entire Chinese-American relationship from a very, very different point of view. And go to uh, our future segments because we will talk about that in more detail. Now, on top of it, we also see in this time period that 400 of the uh, senior government officials in Washington, D.C., signed a letter anonymously, of course, because they don't want the retaliation and the retribution that will come from Biden and his far left-wing team, uh, saying that uh, the Biden foreign policy in relation to Israel and Palestine is 100% wrong. And again, Biden is out of step with the world in the proper way to solve this problem. And uh, that's, boy, that's alarming. I mean, it's very few times in American history that 400 senior administration officials decided to pen a letter criticizing the White House team and basically, basically calling them incompetent. But oh my Lord, it is happening. So what, what is going wrong here? Well, it's, this is a very simple problem. The Israelis, very rich. The Palestinians, extremely can't eat one meal of the day poor, living right next to each other. Is peace possible in that situation? No. So what is the answer? Well, the answer is to encourage the Israelis to do everything they can to help build up the Palestinian uh, comforts, as it were. Help them establish themselves in life with a comfortable living standard, a self-sustainable living standard, like we are going to be doing here in the United States by reintroducing the cottage industry. 
But no, within hours of the, uh, of the Hamas attack on Israel, Biden is sending more warships to, off the coast of, of Israel, transferring large amounts of military equipment to, to Israel, and, and, and quickly says, no, this is wrong. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I support Israel, I support the Palestinians, but I agree with those 400 administration officials, which says, look, our goal has got to be peace. There's no question about it. The Israelis have been fighting for decades. That's not a peaceful part of the world. We need to be doing everything we can to promote goodwill, peaceful relations, and we do that by raising economic living conditions and standards. So moving on, uh, we'll, we'll leave Biden there till the next time. So we'll talk a little bit about Trump. Uh, you know, Trump has been involved in uh, the, these uh, lawsuits to keep him out of the elections. Uh, well, my friend, this is all not going to happen because anybody who knows the legal system realizes that by the time you go through the, the first level of court, the appeals process at the state court, the Supreme Court level at the state court, the Supreme Court level at the federal court, by the time we go through all these different levels of, of courts in the United States, not one single case that Trump is involved in will be disposed of for many years to come. So what does that mean? Well, the Michigan Supreme Court just said that Trump can be on the ballot in Michigan. I'm no fan of Trump, but what I am saying is trying to use the legal system to, uh, to keep him out of office is just, it's a non-starter with the amount of time that's uh, required to answer those uh, uh, court cases and the timing of the elections. So Trump is going to be in the election. It's going to be Trump, Biden, Quigley, and, uh, and Kennedy, which we might get to in a moment. Now, next, we, we can have a quick look at the far right. What is the far right of uh, the political spectrum wanting? They want a democratic dictatorship. Uh, they feel left behind. Their lives have been a misery, and uh, they want a change. Well, they're not going to get that change under Biden. They're not going to get that change under Trump. I would suggest to the far right uh, to give Quigley a look and to understand his policies because every single thing that they are complaining about, uh, I can improve your life's the far right wing of the Republican Party. And you need to realign your interests with mine, and we will make America work for everybody. Um, how does Quigley beat uh, Trump, and how does Bigley Qu uh, Quigley beat Biden? Well, Biden's not suitable for office because of his age. I'm going to beat Trump simply because uh, the voters don't want institutionalism. They don't want institutional presidents. They don't want institutional leaders at the very top. They want folks from the trenches that have an ability to take care of all Americans, and that's how he's going to do it. Well, Kennedy, we'll have to get to the next time, but... Uh, I need you to go to my website, have a look, robertquigleyforpresident.com. Uh, donate what you can. Every dollar, big and small, helps. And together, we will work hard to make America work for all of us. Until we meet again, all the best.